Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. So what I intend to do in this talk is uh, to say a few words by way of introduction, uh, to give a little bit more about Lynette and Fred Boyle uh, as individuals, and then to say a bit about the steady state theory, uh, and particularly to focus on the role of ideology uh, in the promotion of these uh, different theories. Uh, I'll say a little bit towards the end of uh, my anticipation of modern debates, and I will add a little bit of script about the personal relationship between Lemaitre and Boyle. Well, in uh, George Lemaitre and Fred Boyle, we have two characters who are so utterly different in many ways, yet shared one very significant attribute. They were both giants of 20th century cosmology and astrophysics. We've heard and we'll hear a great deal about Lynette. I don't want to uh, cover the same ground again, but there will be a little bit of overlap, inevitably, in what I need by way of comparison. Uh, but briefly, here we have a Roman Catholic, uh, Belgian Roman Catholic priest, who can rightly describe as the father of the Big Bang, and in Hoyle, an atheist Yorkshireman who pioneered the alternative of a steady state universe with neither beginning nor end. So I want to particularly explore the, 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 the way ideology influenced uh, the science of these two great figures. So, uh, Lemaitre's um, primeval atom, unlike the model of his 1927 paper, provided the first ostensibly physical Big Bang model, comprising as it did the two components of expansion and the beginning of time. It was described in an address he gave to the British Association and developed in one of the papers of the Annos Mirabile, as we call it, that in 1931. There was a great deal of ideological suspicion of the idea that the universe had a beginning from the time such theories were first put in until the Big Bang was finally established beyond reasonable doubt by observation of predictable background radiation in 1965. Lurking in cosmologists' minds was no doubt the suspicion that uh, if the universe had a beginning, did it not therefore require a creator? It seems to me that that difficulty has often been perceived as a problem by atheists, whereas theologians can happily see God creating a universe with either a finite or an infinite past. But among those who disliked the idea that the universe had a beginning in time was, of course, Einstein who assigned a, a particular value to the cosmological constant so as to yield a static universe, the Einstein universe. And we heard Eddington, who wrote in 1931 that philosophically the notion of the beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. Interestingly enough, these were quite different characters in terms of religious faith, and that's reflected in the, in the many others who took sides in the state versus Big Bang controversy. Einstein believed in Spinoza's pantheistic God, whereas Eddington was a Quaker. Uh, Helga Craig writes that astronomers in general preferred to speak of the cosmic time scale uh, rather than to date the present epoch from an absolute beginning in time. Indeed, uh, he says in his book, most astronomers prefer to neglect what may seem to be a natural consequence of the evolutionary relativistic worldview. Well, of course, another who didn't like this idea of the temple beginning was Fred Hoyle. And uh, as Simon uh, Mitton said to us, uh, he coined the term Big Bang as a term of abuse because he hated the idea. And nevertheless, this terminology stuck, and the next term, primeval atom, faded away. Um, Clearly, Lemaitre uh, did not share these concerns, but interestingly enough, he also didn't want to identify the beginning of the universe in time with the theological doctrine of creation. So we'll examine that, and Lemaitre's view of science and theology as two different realms, briefly, uh, in this paper, for the purposes of comparison. <coughs> so, Fred uh, Hoyle. He's a bluff Yorkshireman. From the beginning, something of an outsider to the Cambridge world he came to inhabit in his time as an undergraduate. And though he became part of the establishment, so elected FRS, professor at Cambridge, knighted, 
who continued to advance controversial topics <coughs> and to engage in polemical disputes uh, throughout his career. Now, one of the interesting things Hoyle said was that it is better to be interesting and wrong than boring <laughs> and right. <laughs> and this is something the great man lived up to. He, uh, he was a controversialist from the earliest point of his scientific career. He did important work on accretion by stars with Raymond Littleton and later Helen Bond. However, uh, Hoyle and Littleton failed to get their work published in uh, the uh, Royal Astronomical Society Journal of Notices because they refused to accept criticism and modify their paper accordingly. Uh, and eventually they published it in Proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. And there were indeed problems with uh, these, these early papers in the context in which they were conceived, though this whole topic of accretion became important many years later when it was seen to be operative in binary star systems. Um, papers by Paul and Littleton and the Bondi, incidentally, I credited in my own thesis, which was studying accretion in a very different context than the interactive gas by the galaxy. Well, that was an idea that was ahead of its time. Another controversial idea of Hoyle's was <coughs> that of panspermia, uh, which is the idea that life on Earth was seeded from space. <coughs> Um, uh, it was publicized in uh, Hoyle and Hoyt Grammar Singh's book, Life Planet, published in 1978. And along with this came the idea that uh, disease-causing viruses were introduced from space. Hoyle and Hoyt Grammar Singh thought that Darwinian evolution alone was inadequate to account for the explanation uh, of, of the explosion of speciation over the last 600 million years, unless further genetic information were seeded from space. Uh, Simon Mitten in his excellent book, rather, uh, in a blunt he states, they simply didn't accept Darwin in evolution. And that's borne out in Hoyle's book, uh, The Intelligent Universe, written in 1983. There, Hoyle says, the Darwinian theory is wrong because random variations tend to worsen performance. Well, inevitably, um, uh, you can see that this view didn't endear Hoyle and the grammar sing to the biologists. They were the experts in these matters. And Hoyle and McRamerson even claimed in 1985 that the intermediate fossil Archaeopteryx was a fraud. Uh, only, publishing, only publishing this outlandish idea in the British Journal of Photography. <laughs> uh, well, this was another claim that, of course, got them into deep water with the experts. Well, having, having said that, and uh, perhaps being a bit flippant at Hoyle's expense, it was, of course, the steady state theory, uh, which uh, both made him really well known, uh, not least among the general public, and also which was the source of his most serious disputes with the, within the astrophysical community. Well, uh, by, the late, by the 1940s, the evidence of the redshifts interpreted to, as due to the expansion of the universe had seemed to indicate that some version of the Big Bang Theory was correct. The Einstein static universe, um, internal universe, didn't seem to reflect reality. However, a major challenge was that the estimated age of the universe, a couple of billion years or even less, as deduced from the Hubble law, uh, was smaller than the estimated age of the <coughs> gaps, uh, the, the uh, galaxies and stars, and indeed of the Earth itself. Uh, more accurate observations came much later in the late 40s and early 50s. And today we now speak of the universe as 13.7 billion years old. I think the three significant figures indicating how far cosmology has advanced as a science of measurement. But in 1948, however, in the view that there was any kind of evolution at all, was challenged by a new theory which ran clearly contrary to the big bang <coughs> idea, as formulated by Herman Bondi and Thomas Gold that year, it was based on a metaphysical principle called the perfect cosmological principle. This uh, principle amounted to the assumption that not only does the universe on the largest scale present a uniform aspect from wherever within it you look, but also from whatever time in the universe's history uh, anyone is observing. So, the universe looks the same at any place, any time. 
uh, always uh, excluding local irregularities, of course. And it should be stressed that this is indeed a metaphysical principle, not an empirical scientific principle. But in order to account for the observed expansion, it was necessary in the steady state theories that new matter be created from the space created in the space um, between the galaxies as they recede uh, and at just the right rate. Uh, in fact, other steady state type creation models had uh, arisen in the pre war period, quite often associated, interestingly enough, with a metaphysical preference for God continuously creating rather than, as it were, winding up the universe at the beginning and letting it run down. Physicists such as Robert Millikan and uh, others put forward such highly speculative steady state type theories. And indeed, uh, in 1933, such ideas were endorsed from the theological perspective by W.R. Ng, the well known dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. However, uh, there seems to have been an atheist agenda attached to the steady state theory proper, put forward by Bondi and Gold and the significant Boyle, who simultaneously came up with a rather different version of the theory. Nevertheless, the steady state theory um, still attracted Christian support, uh, most notably from the cosmologist William McRae and from the <coughs> Anglican theologian E.L. Uh, Maskell. Uh, Eric Maskell, incidentally, noted how it was entirely in a key keeping with the views of Aquinas. Uh, Aquinas' notion that uh, God both brings things into existence and preserves them in existence so that, uh, quoting from the summer, if he withdraws his action from them, all things would be reduced to nothing. Well, um, again, uh, Helga Craig notes that it was particularly Hoyle who objected to a singular creation event, which was beyond the realm of scientific understanding. In his 1948 paper, Hoyle wrote, for it is against the spirit of scientific inquiry to regard <coughs> observable effects as arising from causes unknown to science. And this is in principle what creation in the past implies. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear again, and as I've already said, the Christian doctrine of creation can happily account for either time of the universe. But another reason the uh, trio uh, rejected standard cosmology was the time scale problem, uh, which could be solved in the Eddington, the Merch, or the Merch, and other evolutionary models, but at the expense of fine-tuning the cosmological constant, which at that time was deemed to be too much of a fudge. Well, interestingly enough, Hoyle initially um, objected to matter creation, um, as suggested by Gold, and this delayed progress on the steady state theory. After all, matter creation would constitute a viola violation of the law of conservation of energy. And in the event, this would mean that two <coughs> versions of the theory uh, were, were, um, <coughs> would emerge, and both in 1948 and one uh, authored by Hoyle and the other by Bondi and Gold. Another very significant difference within this trio was that unlike Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold regarded general relativity as suspect when it extrapolated to the universe as a whole. Uh, in his version of the theory, Hoyle modified Einstein's equations of general relativity by replacing the cosmological term with a creation tensor, which did, after all, give rise to matter, uh, to, uh, to, to, to matter creation and violate energy conservation. The rate of uh, creation um, governed by the creation tensor just matches the rate at which matter recedes across the horizon of the visible universe. But Hoyle would have preferred his approach rather than <coughs> Bondi and Gold, who started instead from this abstract metaphysical principle, the perfect cosmological principle. For Hoyle, that principle was a consequence of his theory rather than an axiom. Now, um, for Bondi and Gold, however, they, they uh, in, uh, thought that the perfect cosmological principle was necessary in order to ensure the constancy of the laws of physics. Well, um, 
a science and religion con uh, context, I might offer a theological principle to you, which would have done what Bondi and uh, Gold wanted. Um, the, the constancy of the laws of physics um, is theologically a sign of the faithfulness of God in upholding the laws with which he has endowed the universe and a sign of God's reliability in maintaining those your laws. Uh, and it's, it speaks to us in Christian theology of the God who is not capricious but faithful. And one could say that this kind of view informed the natural philosophers of the scientific revolution, people such as Johannes Kepler, who saw himself thinking God's thoughts after him when uncovering the laws of planetary motion. No science at all is possible, of course, without some kind of a, a, assumption of this kind, that there is order, and there is law-like behavior out there to be discovered. And why that is the case is not explained by science, but is explained by theology. And of course, it's not an explanation that can be of the proponents of the steady state theory. The perfect cosmological principle implies that the Hubble expansion rate we observe today is the same at all times past, present, and future. And Bondi and Gold calculated uh, very straightforwardly and without any appeal to general relativity. Uh, the rate of creation of matter required to balance the expansion. In Bondi's book, which uh, utilizes an up-to-date figure of the whole constant, he gives a rate of something like the equivalent of one hydrogen atom per liter coming into existence every 500 billion years. Hoyle, in his uh, 1950 radio broadcasts, uh, had a, a, a more graphic way of picturing it as one atom per year in a body of equal to that encompassed by St. Paul's Cathedral. Well, clearly, these, this rate of uh, arrival of new matter in the universe is below uh, any detectable threshold. Well, of course, one of the most uh, bitter disputes in all of cosmology was uh, occasioned by Hoyle's defense of the steady state theory, and it involved Hoyle and the Nobel Prize winning, uh, Nobel Prize winning Cambridge astronomer Martin Ryle. And it was mainly concerned with counts of radio sources uh, once these were established to be extragalactic. And interestingly enough, something which Ryle originally denied uh, that Hoyle was uh, right about. Um, now, if the steady state theory is correct, then um, the number of sources of a given brightness should be uniformly distributed throughout space. And there's then a simple formula, and quite easily derivable formula, for the number of sources n of brightness greater than s. So n is proportional to s to the minus 3 over 2. And therefore, a plot of log n against log s should yield a straight line of slope minus 3 over 2. Well, from about 1954 onwards, Ryle um, <coughs> sought to catalog radio sources and to disprove the steady state theory. Indeed, he apparently achieved results which did that, getting a slope very different from minus 3 over 2. The trouble was that the survey results Ryle presented in 1954, the second Cambridge survey, were unreliable. <coughs> they were contradicted by Australian uh, radio astronomers, and the survey results of 1958, the third Cambridge catalogue, were still disputed. However, uh, by 1961, further results were much more accurate, were confirmed by other observers, and did indeed seem to refute the steady state theory. These latter results uh, were further confirmed by the complete Cambridge 4th Cambridge survey carried out between 1958 and 1964. Uh, the, the steady state advocates stuck. Yes, I'm sorry, there is a sign over there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, thanks. There's about 20 switches. Yeah. We might just press them randomly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but by now, the, 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 the fourth Cambridge survey seemed to, seemed to settle it. Um, though the steady state advocates stuck to their guns despite the mounting evidence, it was, of course, the uh, the observation of the microwave background in 1965, which provided the clinching evidence in favor of the Big Bang. Well, we have begun 
to see already that ideological factors were at work when both the Big Bang and steady state theories were developed, but we need to look at this in a little more detail. Um, one feature which is common to many of the scientists on all sides of this debate uh, is the search for simplicity. Lemaitre, uh, influenced by Einstein, wrote in 1922 that scientific progress is the discovery of a more and more comprehensive simplicity. Einstein himself in 1931 well, rejected his cosmological constant uh, then, his earlier espousal of it, because of its ugliness and lack of simplicity. Bondi and Gold appealed to the principle of simplicity to justify giving priority to the perfect cosmological principle over the principle of conservation of matter energy, which, given the non-detectability of new matter, could be regarded as only approximate. Well, uh, the idea that the simplest of competing hypotheses is most likely to be true, I think, has been and continues to be a guiding useful guiding principle in science, but of course it can't be definitive. And one, as, as, as Craig mentioned, however, one could regard the Bondi gold theory, I think, as too little driven by empirical data, indeed as possibly being rather uh, platonic and rational in being deductive rather than inductive, and that maybe the conservation of energy and the validity of physical laws across space and time are as simple assumptions as to make, to make as is compatible with observation and experiment. It is surely preferable to seek solutions in terms of current well-established physical theories uh, before amending those theories or abandoning them in favor of overarching metaphysical principles. Eddington, I think, would be a scientist who in his search for a fundamental theory, which occupied most of his life from the 1930s, was also adopting a more rational and platonic approach. Well, on the other hand, I think would be a scientist, who, and in the majority of scientists, who downplayed random metaphysical principles and indeed wholeheartedly commented on the philosophy of science at all. However, he didn't simply embrace an alternative empiricist approach, but noted, quite rightly, the interplay of, of theory and experiment. There are no empirical facts which, that are bare or uninterpreted facts. Well, Bondi uh, shared this view, but it's, I think, as uh, Albert Crabb notes, he was more emphatic and uh, provocative in claiming that errors in observation are likely to more, be more frequent uh, than errors in theory, and this upset uh, a lot of people, particularly uh, in, in the US. Um, it's very much downplaying of observation in favor of <coughs> theory. Um, so, Nevertheless, these, uh, these views gave the city state cosmologists grounds for resisting the apparently falsifying data, as well as for having postulated a completely undetectable rate of creation of new matter. But of course, it's in the area of religion where there is the greatest divide. And it seems to me there are two major questions where cosmolog modern cosmology and theology potentially interact. And the first relates to whether the universe had a temporal origin or not, which is the main focus of the discussion today. But as, as I've already said, this isn't really a problem for theology if the doctrine of creation is properly understood. But it is the case that a temporal origin is perceived to be a problem by atheists, up to and including Stephen Hawking to the present day. If we can get rid of a temporal origin of the universe, it's claimed of falsely, of course, but then we can get rid of God. The second question relates to the special way in which the Big Bang and the laws of physics <coughs> need to be set up in order for the universe to give rise to life, the so-called fine-tuning, and we uh, return to this shortly. Indeed, of course, we will have a bit of focus on that tomorrow uh, when we talk about multiverses and all those kinds of issues. Well, uh, we've seen that Hoyle disliked the uh, notion of an initial cause beyond the realms of science, which is what seems to be implied by the Big Bang Theory. And he certainly associated the steady state with atheism. Indeed, he freely expressed an emotional preference for the steady state, even though he saw this that this itself was irrelevant to its acceptance. 
In the last chapter of his book, The uh, Nature of the Universe, uh, called Man's Place in the Expanding Universe, Hoyle explains why he believes the steady state theory to be superior to the Big Bang. There are reasons of physics, such as the time scale problem, and difficulties to deal with galaxy formation, and with either theory, what one is, has to face the problem of creation. However, Hoyle is clear about his problem. In the older theories of all the material in the universe is supposed to have appeared at one instant of time. The whole creation process taking the form of one big bang. For myself, I find this idea very much queerer than continuous creation. And uh, as someone pointed out, this, this, uh, uh, this is a transcription, this book, of Hoyle's further radio broadcasts of 1950. Um, and we have in it the recurrence of this majority term, the bang. At the end of this chapter, Hoyle adds a personal reflection in which he writes this about religion. It seems to me that religion is but a blind attempt to find an escape from, the only, from a truly dreadful situation in which we find ourselves. Here we are in this wholly fantastic universe with scarcely a clue as to whether our existence has any real significance. No wonder, then, that many people feel the need for some belief that gives them a sense of security, and no wonder that they become very angry with people like me who say that this security is illusory. It's uh, no surprise that Hoyle's broadcasts gave rise to considerable controversy, and indeed his long-running dispute with Ryle began somewhere about this time. There were a number of scientists who criticized Hoyle for his too unqualified presentation of his own theory. Uh, the, in July 1950, the philosopher of science Herbert Dingle was allowed to say as much in a responding broadcast. The novelist Dorothy L. Sayers was also allowed to do something similar with respect to Hoyle's religious views, which had occasioned the ire of Geoffrey Fisher, Archbishop of Canterbury, among others. That further association of atheism occur, uh, with the steady state occurs in Hoyle's book Frontiers of Astronomy. Uh, the theory contrasts with the Big Bang, which uh, requires the acceptance of starting conditions, which we are obliged to accept as conditions arbitrarily imposed for no reason that we understand. And Hoyle goes on. This procedure is quite characteristic of the outlook of primitive peoples, who in attempting to explain the local behavior of the physical world are obliged in their ignorance of the laws of physics to have recourse to arbitrary starting conditions. These are given credence by postulating the existence of gods, gods of the sea, gods of the mountains, gods of the forest, and so forth. But it seems to me, uh, actually in contrast to Hoyle, that physics normally proceeds and precisely by a, a, applying a set of physical laws to a set of starting conditions to see how a system evolves. And it seems to be in cosmology uniquely, um, as in Hoyle's day, now um, where the avoidance of starting conditions is being sought. Elsewhere, Hoyle expresses what he sees as the gulf between the way science and religion work. In a lecture given in 1957 in Great St. Mary's University Church here in Cambridge, Hoyle said this, religious thought is not controlled by the requirement that it must make correct predictions concerning the events that take place in the external world. It is controlled by doctrines usually laid down many centuries ago in canonical forms, in the Bible for the Christian, in the Quran for the Muslim. The existence of these written doctrines would seem to make any rooted change of outlook difficult to achieve. In similar vein, Catholicism, like communism, argues by dogma. An argument is judged right by these people not because they judge it to be based on right premises, not because it leads to results that accord with the facts. Indeed, if the facts of the case should disagree with the dogma, then so much worse for the facts. Well, Hoyle shares with the religious person uh, a sense of awe before the universe and the sense that there must be some deep laid purpose there. It is the particularities of religion that he rejects. For example, miracles, which he sees as God constantly correcting his own poor handiwork when things go wrong. 
And in the case of Christianity, particularly such specific doctrines as the virgin birth and the um, deity of Christ, indeed, Hoyle is utterly scathing about such beliefs, which amount to, he says, a denial of rational thought and contradict the very fabric of the world, thus negating the faculty which separates man from the beasts. He states, religion, if it is not to be pernicious nonsense, must be based on rational thinking. If religion were to change its dogmas in the way science does, such changes would have to be on the scale of seeing Jesus as just an exceptional man, rather than God incarnate. Well, I don't think I, I'm alone uh, in, in thinking that the Hoyle's view of religion is naive in a number of ways. Uh, religion may not be predicted in the way that science is, but there are other areas of human inquiry which are not predictive, such as ethics and history. But theology is explanatory. So what he said, scientific laws that codify the regularities normally observed in nature. Um, but they have nothing to say about singular instances, which uh, are miracles for singular instances. And Christian doctrines, I would argue, can be uh, seen as rationally formulated responses to historical evidence and the experience of the church. As an example of an explanatory role for religion, the doctrine of the Imago Dei explains why the inherent logic of the human brain parallels the structure of the universe as a whole. This is something which Hoyle recognizes and alludes to, but circumvents it by identifying God with the universe. How the universe manages to create a pattern of itself inside our heads, as Hoyle believes it does, remains unclear. But for Hoyle, the universe constitutes everything that there is. <coughs> At the um, first chapter of Hoyle's book of 1977, The Ten Faces of the Universe, is called God's Universe. And in it, Hoyle launches another tirade against Christian belief. He remarks that the attributes of God, so frequently and confidently announced from the pulpit, were quite indefensible. And he lists some of them. God the Father, the Family Man, God the Maker of all things, a craftsman or artisan, God Almighty, a war leader, God in heaven, wherever that may be. But rather than engaging with what theologians say about these things, Hoyle contents himself with saying that these are simply uh, man-made, plainly man-made and without meaning. Again, only equating God with the universe makes any sense to Hoyle. His solution to the uh, Northern Ireland problem, incidentally, would be to arrest every priest and clergyman in Ireland and to commit every man judge to long jail sentences on the charge of causing civil war. <laughs> After all, the violence is simply due to priests and clergymen instilling nonsense words and concepts into children, and different nonsense words and concepts uh, into Roman Catholic and Protestant children. Well, despite this negativity towards religion, Hoyle does, however, recognize as significant the second area in which cosmology and religion interact, namely that concerning the fine tuning. <clears throat> Thus he notes that there are very surprising connections between the origin of life, the building up of chemical elements inside stars, and the laws of nuclear physics. These connections are either random quirks, he says, or signs of a super-intellect behind the universe. Hoyle famously predicted a resonance, an enhanced effect in the carbon atom at just the right level to ensure that carbon could be manufactured efficiently by nuclear synthesis in stars, despite the intermediate product beryllium being unstable. At the same time, it turned out that there was an energy level in oxygen just below that which would make the production of oxygen resonant, and thereby turn all the carbon into oxygen. Well, it is indeed worth noting what Coyle says more extensively on this point. In his Great St. Mary's lecture, he said this, if this were a purely scientific question, and not one that touched on the religious problem, I do not believe that any scientist who examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed with regard to the consequences they produce inside the stars. If this is so, then my apparently random quirks have become part of a deep laid scheme. If not, 
then we are back again to a monstrous sequence of accidents. In an article, um, it's a bit small, I'm afraid, uh, but I've opened it up. In article 1981, Boyle wrote, from 1953 onwards, Father and I have been intrigued by the remarkable relation <coughs> of the 7.65 MeV energy level in the nucleus of carbon-12 to the 7.12 MeV level in oxygen-16. If you wanted to produce carbon and oxygen in roughly equal quantities by stellar nuclear synthesis, these are just the two levels you would have to fix, and your fixing would have to be just about where these levels actually are found to be. Is that another put-up artificial job? Following the above argument, I'm inclined to think so. A common-sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super-intellect has much with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. To me, it seems difficult to reconcile these remarks with the minimalist religious view expressed by Boyle earlier, where God is, whereby God is identified with the universe. It seems to me that persons are intelligent, not the universe per se, and the Christian God, at any rate, is conceived to be personal. Boyle's alternative to this in the intelligent universe is a considerable degree of speculation to do with backwards and forwards causation in time. He says, information comes from the future to control quantum events. Uh, and that uh, strikes me as similar to, to uh, ideas um, promoted by John Wheeler, observer creating reality and so on. He says that information uh, like bearing information is transferred into new forms from the past to the future along, and that reminds me of uh, some of the things that Frank Tipler has said, and results in collective immortality. And these time, two time flows of information are interrelated like this. We are the intelligence that preceded us in its new material representation. Or rather, I think slightly backtracking from that, which is ultra, ultra paradoxical, uh, we are the re-emergence of that intelligence, the latest embodiment of its struggle for survival. This paradoxical uh, sounding scheme appears to resemble the closed quantum loop, causal loops uh, invoked by Wheeler and more recently Paul Davis. Boyle recognizes the similarity of uh, the quantum controller in one to the Christian God outside the universe and to Greek deism who manage an existing cosmos. The advantage of his scheme is that, Hoyle's exist that God's existence is uh, also dependent on the universe. And Hoyle also blames attacks uh, on the steady state period in the 1950s in this book as arising because we were touching on issues that threatened the theological culture on which Western civilization was founded. Whereas he says, the Big Bang Theory requires a recent origin of the universe that openly invites the concept of creation. So very much the ideological juxtaposition of the two theories. Now when it comes to Le Maire, well clearly he was in the opposite camp to Bondi, Gold and Boyle in the matter of religion. Uh, incidentally, Bondi was chairman of the British Humanist Association, and became so, and of the Rationalist Press Association. So uh, we have in Bondi a pretty serious atheist. What about the mayor? Well, Alain Goddard and uh, Michael Heller discovered an unpublished manuscript from about 1922 in which Le Maire states that the universe began with light, uh, which occurred just as Genesis had suggested. However, Goddard further notes that Le Maire was too careful a scientist to build his theory on what was no more than an intuitive opinion. A scientific basis was necessary. And again, according to Helga Craig, Le Maire's theology may have influenced his preference for a spatially finite universe, <coughs> one with positive curvature over an infinite universe. The finitude finite of the universe was asserted by Aquinas and goes back to Aristotle. There were times, of course, an infinite universe has been postulated in Christian theology, for example, by uh, Cardinal Nicholas of Fusa in the 15th century. Well, it, it, this is all very interesting because, again, it's a matter of, uh, of dispute in uh, philosophical discussion of modern cosmology, the latest ideas. Some, including, um, uh, I think, George Ellis uh, and uh, the philosopher William Lane Craig,
Craig have questioned whether an infinity of physical things as opposed to infinities treated in pure mathematics can actually exist. And uh, have said that, of course, in any case, a physical infinity uh, can always be added to it, is never complete. Well, uh, again, uh, according to, to, to Howard Craig, the Met couldn't take a steady state theory seriously, mainly because it differed so radically from its own view, but possibly because he thought it incompatible with its theology. But none of this implies that he actually advanced his own theory from theological motives. And indeed, the weight of evidence is uh, that he didn't consider his theory to have any intrinsic theological significance. This uh, particular approach is uh, apposite. As far as I can see, such, theory, such a theory remains entirely outside any metaphysical or religious question. Uh, as we've heard, it leaves the materialist free to deny any transcendental being. He may keep from the bottom of space-time the same attitude of mind he has been able to adopt for events occurring in non-singular places in space-time. Space well, um, there was, of course, the famous dispute with the Pope, which uh, Dominic Lombert has already alluded to, and we will be hearing more about that from Bill Carroll uh, later on. The Pope making a logical argument, the existence of God, essentially, from the Big Bang Theory. Well, uh, Lemaitre, um, he was uh, usually irrepressibly cheerful, was deeply unhappy about this and intervened uh, with the Pope's advisor. Uh, he said the Big Bang was still a hypothesis, had a strong rival in the steady state theory. <coughs> Bernard McMullen recalled uh, Lemaitre saying that the universe could easily have gone through a previous phase or contraction, just like uh, Gamma thought that uh, you could have a psychic universe. And indeed, Lemaitre thought it confirmed the suspicions of Hoyle and others of the theological agenda behind the Big Bang. Uh, and, and, uh, and the Pope, incidentally, um, had quoted uh, E.T. Whitaker, who, the mathematician who had made a similar kind of argument from the Big Bang theory. So Lemaitre intervened. Uh, for him, there were two distinct <laughs> paths of truth, the two paths which he uh, followed. He followed both. And he said, made this interesting remark uh, about the Bible. He was, of course, very far from being a fundamentalist. <coughs> to believe that the Bible teaches science is like assuming that there must be authentic religious dogma in the binomial theory. <laughs> that was a rather fun remark. If the Bible is right about immortality and salvation, it is simply fallacious to believe it is right about everything else. That is completely to miss the point of why we were given the Bible in the first place. Uh, when Dirac asked Lemaitre, uh, or, or said to Lemaitre that he thought cosmology was the branch of science closest to religion, Lemaitre disagreed, saying he thought psychology was the closest. Well, um, uh, when I say modern debates, I think modern things going on uh, 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 to do with cosmology. Lemaitre's idea has been borne out by the uh, cosmological constant discovered uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, and much of um, what Hoyle did has is also being anticipated um, in, in a number of different ways. Um, his, which Simon Minton mentioned, mentioned him as a great popularizer, and there's danger to that, I think. Um, he was a great popularizer, uh, but made himself unpopular in, uh, amongst many uh, of his colleagues. Um, there was a, a review in the Manchester Guardian of um, his book, um, Frontiers of Astronomy, which was really quite critical because a uh, great book in many ways, but the book was being too dogmatic with regard to Hoyle's own view. Um, very fine, but, uh, but, but too dogmatic. And I think that is a danger in popularization today. Um, a danger I think um, uh, I can safely say is avoided by all of the people speaking at this conference. But uh, it, is, it is out there, I can tell you. That, that, that danger is out there. People unequivocally are promoting their own particular theory, and, and uh, even though it, however speculative. Well, one of the interesting things that Hoyle did uh, towards the end of his life was, uh, uh, no, back in 1949, in a radio broadcast, he made this interesting speculation about an infinite universe. 
And he said that there would be multiple copies of Boyle during a similar broadcast elsewhere in the infinite universe. Although he uh, didn't see it, uh, it seems to me that this um, idea that there are multiple copies of this lecture going on, for example, um, uh, around zillions upon zillions of universes, I think that's a reason to be a bit skeptical. It, um, <laughs> it's at least paradoxical, and it raises questions of human identity and free will. And if we're going back to, um, I mean, if I make the same, if every choice I could possibly make, infinitely many times in infinitely many universes, then I, I think that is uh, a pretty strange thing to get your head around. It doesn't disprove it, of course, but I think uh, uh, metaphysically uh, preferable and, and simpler, uh, from that point of view, would be a unique universe. Well, here's a, a nice quote, I think. Um, um, we're celebrating his 60th birthday. Uh, in an interview with Nature, he made these comments. Many of the past generation believed they were very close to the ultimate structure of the universe, but it was only a question of time before extra work would fix the final details. I don't believe this at all myself. I think what we see is a tiny fragment of a much bigger structure. The big advances in astronomy come when there are big advances in physics. We shall find it difficult to arrive at a unique answer for the universe because we see only part of it. And I think that's a, 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 a notably, um, well, there's a notable element of humility in that statement, um, which I think is a, is a good one, at which I not quite to draw an end, because I do did want to just say a bit about how Boyle and Lebesch related to the <coughs> And all the evidence is that they got on extremely well, uh, despite fundamental disagreements over cosmology and indeed over religion. And I told you uh, what his views of priests were. Uh, I will end with a nice anecdote given by uh, John Farrell in his uh, book um, uh, concerning a two-week drive that Hoyle and his wife Barbara took with the mesh in the Italian Alps in uh, 1957. They were dining one night, which happened to be a Friday. Hoyle ordered a steak, uh, <laughs> and Le Maire ordered fish. Hoyle's steak came, it was, it was kind of okay, moderate size. Le Maire's fish arrived, and it was enormous. <laughs> and Hoyle commented, now at last, George, I can see why you are a Catholic. <laughs> At which the man's face you know, screwed up um, and he became uh, red faced and peevish, as Hoyle puts it. And Hoyle was deeply puzzled. How have I committed some terrible religio diplomatic indiscretion? Well, he realised at that point, but he just remembered that Hoyle, that uh, the man hated fish. <laughs> <laughs> I think in your early discussion of Fred Hoyle, yes. it would be appropriate to say that his greatest contribution was a nuclear synthesis, Absolutely. particularly the B squared FH papers, one of the really great papers of modern astrophysics. Yeah. I think they should have gone in in that first discussion. You, you, you're absolutely right, and of course it comes in with the discussion of the fine tuning. Yeah. Absolutely right. This B, B squared FH, very famous paper. Uh, it's the one that got far the Nobel Prize, I think. Uh, and one of the interesting things I saw recently in uh, St. John's College, uh, where they had an exhibition about Hoyle, was actually a deeply apologetic letter from Farah to Hoyle um, about the fact that Farah had got the Nobel Prize and Hoyle had been omitted because he thought, I mean, Farah himself thought that that was, was unjust. This was uh, brilliant stuff, all that nuclear synthesis stuff, absolutely brilliant work, uh, as, you, as, you, as you say. Yeah. Well, um, on the uh, subject of uh, Hoyle as a controversial figure, uh, perhaps I could uh, relate a, a personal experience. Um, in the night, early 1960s, Britain and Australia uh, joined together to build a big telescope in Australia. Uh, <coughs> in the late 60s, Fred Hoyle was appointed to the uh, Anglo-Australian Telescope Board. 
and he became director, or chairman, chairman of that board for about five years, beginning in 1970. That was a very difficult time, uh, to getting the two countries together, all of the cost overruns, all of the technical problems. He gave superb leadership to that whole project. Yes. And uh, as a result, the telescope has been immensely successful. In fact, I would say um, that it was the, uh, the prime reason that Britain is now a leader in, again in optical astronomy. Thanks. Thank you. That's, that's tremendous. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, and that's documented Simon Minton's book. And indeed, uh, uh, he, he, he talks about that. And, and I think what I want to say is that uh, nothing I've, I've said I want, would want to detract from Boyle being a very great uh, cosmologist and astrophysicist. You know, I'm obviously coming up religion from a slightly different angle than him. But uh, he was certainly a very great figure and uh, did uh, tremendous, that was tremendously important. Uh, yes, now that's, uh, you, you started with a reference to the perfect cosmological principle. Yes. And uh, you uh, said that this was, of course, a physical principle. Yes. Which may be right, uh, but it depends on what one means with that. Uh, because it certainly was not more metaphysical than the ordinary cosmological right. principle. Right. It was not really a priori. Right. Uh, it's true that, that uh, uh, Gold, at some time, he said that if this principle contrasts with some experimental fact, yeah. then we are willing to dismiss these exper experimental facts. Yes. But on the other hand, Bunty in particular, I mean, he was a very great advocate of Popperian falsifiability. Yes, yes. And I mean, the whole point of this his version of state state theory was that uh, if some observation clearly uh, uh, contrasted with the theory, then this was the end of it. Yes. So, so uh, uh, it was, I would rather call the perfect cosmological principle an, an, an assumption. Yes. There's not, not, nothing particular metaphysical. Well, of course, you, uh, yes, thank you for that. And of course, and some, you have to make some kinds of assumptions to get anywhere at all. And the cosmological principle is needed to get any of the Friedman Lebesgue solutions in the first place. That's, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so in a way, it's an extension of that. Um, but uh, okay, I mean, it's, it's an assumption that they, they start. With. And I think that point about falsifiability is extremely important, though it does seem interesting, in fact, how the steady state has resisted, um, you know, during the fifties and sixties and yes, beyond. That, I mean, that was a great difference between Hoyle and Bundy. They, yeah. they responded very, very. Yeah. very Differently, yeah. uh, Bundy simply lost interest in yes. Or right. he kept on modifying his views. Yes. Bundy moved to be uh, scientific advisor to the Ministry of Defence, I think. That's head of the natural environment, <laughs> <laughs> and then president of uh, Churchill. Yeah, yeah indeed. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, mm. um, you spoke about the, the fear, the disappointment of Fred Oil and perhaps also Ervin Bondi concerning an expansion universe, immersion in expansion, because uh, it could be uh, consistent with the idea of creation. Yes. But from a strictly uh, physical point of view, um, of course, if, if you extrapolate the equations uh, for T approaching zero, yes. uh, the density and temperature diverge. Yes. And did Absolutely. Fred Oil uh, make any comment about this? Because from a, a physical point of view, it's not a model for a beginning. Well, that, that's right. I think uh, he, um, he, 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 he uh, I'm not sure he did. I don't know if Simon can help us on that. I mean, did he comment on the on T equals naught at all? In fact, no. No, no. Hmm. no, I don't think we could. I don't think he commented on it at all. I mean, uh, I, he did seem to, uh, he did dislike the idea of a temple beginning. I think that, that's for sure. Essentially, but, a heuristic or a philosophical yeah, basis, yeah. because there are no other basis for this. Well, well, that's right. That's right. I, 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 yeah, that's right. Mm. Thomas, next time. I, I was just following up with Professor Craig Rookie Barn. I think even Stephen Hawking has said that, that the Hoyle steady state, or the Hoyle body gold steady state theory, was a great scientific theory because it was definitely falsifiable. I mean, yeah. you know, it proved to be false, but it was a good theory that's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Yeah. Just a quick question. I'm, I'm, I'm 
assuming that uh, Richie Dawkins is among the biologists who are unhappy with some of Fred Hoyle's uh, comments in the Journal of Photography. Well, that's, yes, I, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure he would be. Yes, uh, he seizes. He seizes though on uh, Hoyle's um, very seven or seven gambits and utilizes that against God, who is uh, supremely complex and couldn't have come into it. Well, God came into existence in the way a biological organism does. But he uses that argument that is used by creationists um, that comes out of Hoyle, um, and Dawkins uses it against. God, who he sees as complex. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Uh, it seems to me that, um, from all that we've heard this morning, that the Met and the well, tacitly accepted um, that space time was the, the fundamental uh, of the existence. Right. Um, did any of the scientists of that generation? Consider or speculate that it might not be, and that it might itself be an emergent property of something deeper and more profound. Space time might have emerged from something else. Yes. Not to my knowledge, though. <laughs> Other experts may. Well, they quoted yeah. nature. They quoted yeah. nature. He said that the, the universe started before space and time. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, well, 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 Lemesh said that. Lemesh yes, yeah. himself said that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Picking up the Dawkins thing, I mean, some of Hoyle's comments on religion sound very much like um, certain biologists and philosophers we might be able to name. Um, I almost thought Hoyle was going to say the steady state theory has made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. <laughs> but, um, are, there, are there lessons that we can learn from Hoyle's interactions with religion in terms of the contemporary debate? Well, that's that, that. I, I think, um, well, it's very interesting. Maybe we can learn something from um, you know the grand design, and uh, that's been. Um, and we'll hear more about that this afternoon, I think, with um, the Hawking's latest latest book with Lenin and Lodinov, and the claim that uh, God has been done away with, and, and, and so on, and and, and very closely linking, uh, as did Will at the temple beginning with the God. I mean, that is what Hawking does, and. Uh, Talking like Hoyle claims that you can get rid of God if you get rid of the term at the beginning. So I, I, I think there are similar things happening. They're in a different, sort of different world, but there are similar things happening. Continuing the, the same theme. This here you contrasted two great scientists, uh, one being an atheist, one being religious, whereas in contemporary debates, let's say in this very, very popular level. Atheist scientists are contrasted with religious people who aren't great scientists. And isn't that a problem that we, in general, have with debates? I mean, it's easy to say, oh, science works, obviously. Yeah. Um, um, well, I think there are, uh, just to, today, as um, throughout history, there are great scientists uh, who are religious believers, and there are great scientists who are not. Um, in the popular mind, uh, the, the atheist scientist tends to tends to be the one who's highlighted, um, or, or uh, science tends to be linked with atheism, I and mean, I think that's sort of deeply mistaken. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know how many FRSs quite uncounted up at this conference, but you know, there are certainly a number of believers who are FRSs and, uh, uh, and are present here with us. So, I mean, and of course there have been sociological studies of U.S. particularly about the same proportion of religious believers among scientists now as there were in 1917. Things I tell you much, much more about that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think there, there are believers and non-believers in, in, in science as there always have been. I think one of the developments in the 19th century with the evolution debate and so on was for science to become more and more autonomous from the church, um, and that was Huxley's problem. That was, uh, clergy dominated science. And, uh, you had a country parish in the 19th century, oh, but there were such things today. <laughs> <laughs> you could be, uh, you know, in one small community of 50 or 100 people, you could, uh, you could be a, a, a scientist. Um, but that, that changed. And I think the, 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 the stranglehold that the church seemed to have is, is what was challenged. And, and so science has become much more, much more professional. Of course, it has to be today. 